Hello again and welcome to our RBD video. I hope you are doing well by God's grace and I hope you've been able to go beyond the five miles radius. I hope you've been able to visit the beach, maybe. Um, I hope you've been enjoying uh, reading, the, reading through the book of 1 Samuel. I hope you've been helped as we journey through the book of 1 Samuel. We get to meet people like Samuel, uh, Saul, David, Jonathan, and more importantly, we get to read about God's character, his justice, his wisdom, his holiness in uh, the book of 1 Samuel. I don't know about you, but sometimes I think, what is the point of reading uh, through this uh, old books? Well, for example, 1 Samuel, what is the point? Can I learn anything from it? Is it relevant to the 21st century? Uh, shouldn't I be spending more time in the New Testament, which is more relevant? And in those moments, I reminded of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. I'm sure you know this well, but let me read it anyway, just to remind us why it is important. Um, Paul says to Timothy, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness, that the man or the woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Um, so maybe we are finding it difficult and challenging. Maybe we have more questions than answers. But let's keep persevering. Let's keep plodding as we read through the book of 1 Samuel. Anyway, this week we are in 1 Samuel chapter 8 all the way to chapter 15. But as usual, I just want to focus on one or two themes uh, in our time together. So please do grab your Bibles if you have one with you around you um, and turn with me to 1 Samuel 8. Uh, chapter 8 is an interesting one. We are straight away introduced to the people of Israel uh, demanding a king. Uh, Samuel's son, Joel, and Abijah were judges or leaders. They were meant to lead people uh, in a way that is good and right, in a way that serves God, in a way that is good. Um, and instead, we read that they took bribes and perverted justice, just like the sons of Eli, uh, as we read before in the earlier chapters. Uh, so the people come up to Samuel and said, appoint us a king to judge us. Appoint us a king. We want a king. We want a king like the other nations. We want a king to judge us, to lead us. Well, we say, what is wrong with their request? Uh, it seems legitimate enough. Not quite. Look at chapter 8, verse 7. It says this. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, Samuel, but they have rejected me from being king over them. That is a strong uh, sentence, isn't it? I mean, I hope we can see the problem right there that they didn't want a king for the sake of having a king. They wanted a king because they have rejected God himself. Um, they wanted uh, God. They didn't want God to be their king anymore. They didn't want him to be their king. They didn't want him to be their leader. They didn't want to follow his ways. They didn't want him at all. They want a king, a human king, just like the other nations, just like those nations over there. And we have Genesis 3 all over again. Adam and Eve, we read that they didn't want God's authority or kingship over them anymore when they disobeyed God by taking uh, the fruit, the forbidden fruit from that tree. What they're saying is we don't want God uh, to be our king. We want to be our own king. We want to follow a different king. We can't help but ask, uh, what about us at this point, even? What about us? What about me? What about you? What about us as a church? Um, Israel was meant to be different. They were meant to be a nation whose behavior and lifestyle was to be governed by God's ruling word. And we saw this in the book of Exodus with all the laws that God has given them, not like an army general to his uh, battalion, but more like a father giving uh, these good laws. For the flourishing of his children. They were meant to be different from other nations, distinct and holy. They were meant to be a light to the nations, but their request for a king is a rejection of their identity, their identity as children of God. They have rejected God himself. Similarly, the church, our church, is called to be different, to be distinct and holy. Uh, we are told in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, what the church is meant to be. Peter, writing to the church, uh, to the churches, uh, says this, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, 
that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. This is what church is meant to be, Peter says. Are we? Am I? We may not want a physical king, but worth pondering what some of what are some of the things that rules us? What are some of the things that we've made a king out of? Or maybe our churches uh, look more like the culture around us than it looks like Christ. Maybe our own lives are more governed by the culture around us than it is governed by Christ. Chapter 8 begins with the people rejecting God as their king. And by the time we come to, come to chapter 15, uh, chapter 15, 15 begins by God rejecting their king. Saul was anointed as king. He's an interesting character. Uh, but what was his downfall? Chapter 15, verse 23, we are told, because you have rejected, this is God speaking to Saul, because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected you from being king. Saul's downfall was failure to obey God's word. See, God commanded to get rid of God's enemies, his enemies, uh, the Malachites. But Saul failed to do that completely. He also performed the sacrifice which only a priest could do. Again, he disobeyed God. And interestingly enough, Saul, uh, the name uh, Saul means ask for, to ask something, which is interesting because he was what the people asked for. And eventually he became the king, their king, who they've asked for. They wanted a human king, a king like the other nations. And this is what exactly what Saul has become, a king like the other nations, a king who is more interested in himself, in the things around us, in the things around them, the culture around them. He's not interested in God anymore. So what kind of God, what kind of king is God looking for? Uh, next week we will meet David, but even he, even he, King David, as we go on, we'll find out that he wasn't perfect. We will see the same with David's son, as we read on in the Bible, Solomon. Again, he wasn't perfect. Instead, we are given a taster, even at this point, in, uh, through the salvation history, through the uh, biblical history, even at this one, we are given a taster of what God's perfect king uh, will look like. Um, Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew writes about Jesus in chapter 21, verse 4 and, four, uh, 4 and 5. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal, of a beast of burden. This is uh, Matthew talking about uh, the triumphant, Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. So here is Matthew saying that this is God's king. So the question we are left hanging is this. Will we follow this king? Will we follow this king? Will we receive this king or will we reject this king? Will we follow God's king? I hope we do. In all that we do and say, in all who we are as a family, as an individual and as a church family, that we will follow God's King, our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.